Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the Opportunistic Trader. It is a busy Wednesday, October 17th. It's 11 a.m. and we're joined by Commodity Research Group's Ed Meir. How are you, Ed? Fine, Michael. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. We've got a lot of activity going on. You know, the volatility is at 19 right now. And so uh, the markets have been moving around a lot the past week, which is uh, good for opportunities. And uh, so, yeah, from that front, pretty good. Uh, but I'm interested to hear, uh, you know, last time you were on, you talked about coming, going to uh, London for a metals conference, which you just were at. And so I'm interested to hear more about that and your thoughts on the commodity market. Sure. Uh, last week, I was in London for the London Metal Exchange Dinner. This is a, a gathering of people from all over the metals industries around the world. Um, Tuesday night is the dinner itself where, where, you, where you hear you know, a variety of speakers, including a guest speaker. Nobody pays attention to what the guest speaker is saying. All they do is at each table, they bet on the length of his or her speech. Hmm. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's the main highlight. So uh, this year was 18 and a half minutes, <laughs> which I missed. And Blythe Masters of JP Morgan fame was the keynote speaker. So she's moved on to blockchain now. She's no longer doing credit default swaps. But she had some interesting remarks. But what struck me about metals last week, this is copper, zinc, aluminum, uh, lead. Um, they all held up fairly well, despite the fact that we saw a big imp implosion in U.S. equity markets. You, typically, when stocks fall, metals also kind of follow, follow their lead. But this time around, they held up very well. And we think that's largely because the underlying fundamentals for a lot of these metals are, are quite supportive. You know, stocks are low. Um, all six of the uh, base metals we follow are in deficit this year, meaning the supply is not catching up with, with underlying demand. So, uh, so they did not buckle. They, they kind of held their own. And over the last few days, they even had a bit of a rally. So that was interesting. So what do you take on that, the fact that, like you said, some of the uh, base metals, not so much the precious metals, base metals typically tend to go with the risk assets and equities lower, base metals typically lower. The fact that they're holding in, do you take that as uh, strong price action? Yeah, I do. I, uh, you know, the, the base metals are kind of decoupling from equities, looking at, you know, although China is slowing, the, the, the hope or the perception is that the Chinese will stimulate their economy, hence there'll be more metals demand. Keep in mind, the Chinese did the same thing in 2015, 2016, when their economy also faced another downdraft. And arguably, they were in much worse shape then than they are now. So people are not freaking out by dumping all the metals like we saw in 2015 to 16. They're, hold, they're hanging in there and, and hoping that once you, 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 we get some sort of a resolution to the trade dispute or at least a lowering of the temperatures, the metals will be ready to kind of move higher. So that's what's keeping it up. Um, gold finally responded last week. You know, every time the stock market drops in the past, we have seen a very limited increase in gold prices, if any. But uh, last week, given that we were falling for five or six consecutive days, uh, gold finally uh, finally took off as as a safe haven and moved up about thirty dollars. I think it had its biggest one day move since. Uh, in, in over two years, I think it was up $35 an ounce one, uh, on last Monday or Tuesday. I was traveling, of course, but that's what I read. So gold seems to have moved up. Again, it's stalled right now a little bit, uh, given that we seem to be stabilizing a little in, in U.S. equities, today's uh, action notwithstanding. Um, so I, I'm not that upbeat on gold. I think we'll probably head into another trading range uh, situation, although a little bit higher than, than we were a few weeks ago. Uh, silver, not doing as well. Uh, it, it did not hit uh, uh, new highs. And palladium and platinum are holding up uh, pretty well in line with a uh, steadier base metals complex. So, so let's talk about gold for a second, though. Um, you know, like you said, it had one of its biggest days in I don't even know, maybe a year or so. Right. And we have, like you said, it, it's kind of held for about five days now. It's been 
low vol since that move. What do you take from that? And is there any news for the move? Or do you think it's just the market got oversold and this is kind of went through finally kind of the range it was trading between like 1190 and 1215 and then popped right. through that? Yes, it was trading at uh, at that range that you mentioned for about a month. Uh, short interest during that time was accumulating. So there was quite a lot of shorts that needed to cover. And once we broke out of that 1220, I think we saw the short covering come in. Uh, the dollar didn't really do much uh, over the past week. It kind of held was pretty much unchanged basis the dollar index so that kind of helped gold move up but i think it really responded to the fact that stocks kept uh, this u.s stock market kept falling you know uh it doesn't gold doesn't really move if you get a 500 point down day uh on one day but if you get you know 500 points over five days <laughs> that, that'll finally do it so uh, I think that's what happened with with, with gold um, now I don't think the stock market will drop much more from here so we could see limited gains on gold going forward charts suggest 1240 is next resistance and probably that 1220 which was previous resistance will now be support Yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's been a fascinating move because, you know, gold hasn't really done a whole lot. It went down, uh, you know, in the months of April, May, June, and then really did nothing for a few months. And we had that one big day and now we've kind of paused again. Question is, is it seen as a, you know, safe haven as it once was or, you know, what the real story behind it is? Is it looking at yields? Is it looking at the yen? Um, yeah, um, but it's definitely doing its own thing. Uh, but like you pointed out before, base metals have been, you know, trading pretty supportive. Right. From talking at the conference, what was the general tone about uh, China and their demand? Anything on yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, most people I talk to are still pretty upbeat on China. They're doing business with China. Some of their businesses are are not doing as well, of course, with with uh, with the tariffs and the ban on scrap that has been imposed uh, this year. A lot of the scrap traders that we know, their business was off. But you know, people are still optimistic. They think China will still need the metal units. So if they don't import the scrap, they will imp import cathode, which is the refined product. Or, the, or they'll import something else, some higher type of scrap that will be let in because it has less impurities. So uh, the Chinese economy, from what, what we were hearing, parts of it are, are weak, but uh, real estate is still very strong. You know, prices are continuing to go up. Um, so construction is strong, internal infrastructure spending, it's slowing a bit, but uh, it's still, you know, the overall outlays are, are still massive. Uh, but one thing you have to remember about China, um, there is so much internal momentum and, and dynam dynamism in that economy that it's hard to just write it off and say it's going to crash as President Trump typically does. He looks at their stock market. You know, nobody is buying stocks in China. People are buying real estate. People are developing businesses. Services are growing. In fact, services are higher as a percentage of GDP than manufacturing is. So stock markets are, are, are not an accurate gauge of what's going on in the economy. Um, and you have a government that's very much involved in micromanaging things, much more so than we are here. And so I, I, I think you, 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 you have to give them credit for, for navigating uh, uh, these uncertainties. And I, I think they'll be able to pull it off despite what's going on with trade. Also on the trade front, again, the White House is looking at the numbers. You know, we import 500 billion, they, they import 130 billion, therefore things are unfair. You know, that's, very, uh, that's a very cosmetic analysis. You know, the Chinese reinvest the money that they make on the trade side. Uh, they buy, you know, they buy real estate, they buy treasuries, they buy services. So on balance, the, you can't really just look at the trade component. Uh, and secondly, we really have to be careful about pushing the Chinese too hard because they have lots of cards to play. You know, a lot of the companies that are exporting from China are in fact American companies. So we, we don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot by, by playing hardball with them. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's the the delicate balance that, uh, you know, we have to walk that line. And then, you know, we have the midterm elections coming up and really it's rapidly approaching two or three weeks from, I guess, about three weeks from now. And so that'll be uh, pretty interesting to see how that plays out uh, any sort of, uh, uh, I guess, any sort of traction before that. Yes, exactly. We talked about this last time. I, I, uh, I'll, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Um, we could see, we, you know, even if the Democrats get control of the House, which they will, and possibly the Senate, we could see kind of a relief rally because, you know, the uncertainty will be over. Uh, and despite the fact that the Democrats will be in the House, markets like gridlock so equity markets might even move higher after the election because the thinking is that nobody will be tampering with anything anytime soon if the democrats try to raise taxes for example trump could veto it you need two-thirds in the senate to override that you may not have it so the market will kind of look ahead and 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 see the horizon pretty clear in terms of investment earnings and overall overall growth so we need to get that out of the way um, but I, I I think a gridlock situation might be might be a positive for the markets I, I was gonna ask you about that I'm not so sure why would gridlock be good if basically neither side can pass anything you know right now what we've had over the past two years you know Trump's been able to push a few things through and the market has seemed to have liked that but if we get to a gridlock you know that could you know, for both sides well, just fighting. Gridlock, and nothing gridlock is done. good because they've passed the tax cuts, especially on the corporate side. That's where you're getting the biggest bang for the buck. And gridlock will mean they're not going to rescind the, the tax cuts. They won't have the votes. I mean, if the Democrats get both the House and the Senate in, a, in massive proportions, you could conceivably have them introduce legislation to uh, rescind the corporate tax cuts, which would be tough for stocks to handle but if they see both parties kind of just not being able to do anything the current landscape will be will stay at it as it is which means earnings will will remain strong yeah well it's definitely something to keep an eye on you know i'm uh, going back to i know you mentioned last time you think that china is in no hurry and you weren't even talking about midterm elections you were saying this is something that could drag out for a year year and a half that sort of thing uh, that they, you know, uh, are playing a game that they, you know, are patient on. Right, exactly right. I mean, they have a, you know, 100-year outlook, so they could easily outweigh us. Uh, I think this, uh, again, from my from my trip last week, many people said the same thing, uh, basically that they're going to be very patient, very cautious. They don't want to, uh, you know, uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater. They they don't want to do anything rash. In fact, they're they are very uh, they've been very nice to the foreign companies that are operating in China. They haven't pressured them yet. Uh, U.S. companies that are going to to China are finding you know finding entry difficult, but the existing U.S. operations are are still being very carefully uh, nurtured by the government because they don't want to disrupt anything for the moment. Yeah. So um, we'll see what happens. Um, uh, President Xi is supposed to meet President Trump next month. You know, I'm hoping they will at least agree. They're not going to agree on solving everything, but maybe they could agree to put negotiating teams back in place to hash out some of these issues. But I think that's going to take a long, long time. Um, so scouring the entire uh, marketplace, equities, fixed income, currencies, commodities, you know, what is the commodity research team uh, taking a look at the market right now think is an attractive uh, trade both either on the long side or the short side over the next uh, few weeks? Um, on the in the metals group, I think aluminum is wor- is lo- worth looking at. Aluminum, I- I'm not really sure how how your readers can play it. There might be some aluminum companies that they might look at, but aluminum is uh, is benefiting from the fact that it's in a severe deficit. Uh, number one, number two, overall inventories have been dropping 
quite uh, quite sharply. And number three, the input costs to make aluminum, such as alumina, uh, are really very high. In fact, 40% uh, of the world's smelting capacity right now is at break even or at a loss because the alumina price is so high that smelters, when they turn it into aluminum, cannot really recoup uh, a lot of profits. Uh, so they're, in fact, they're losing money. So something has to give. Either the alumina price has to go down or aluminum prices have to move higher. And we think the alumina market is going to remain tight for a while. So we, we would think aluminum could go a bit higher. So some of the aluminum equities, uh, you know, something like an Alcoa might be interesting to, to look at going into year end. I think Alcoa actually has earnings today after the bell. Yes. Uh, the other thing that's uh, happening on the metal side, the Chinese artificially squeeze supply at this time of the year. Keep in mind, they go into their winter season where, where pollution readings typically spike. So the government fans out across the country and tells steel smelters, aluminum smelters, zinc smelters, you have to cut production by 10% across the board or 20% or whatever it is to reduce production. So in effect, they're, they're going to be squeezing supply and that could give metal prices a bit of a lift uh, going into a year end as well. Uh, precious metals, I'm kind of neutral on right here. Uh, gold does look good on the charts. Uh, it, it does have its breakout. But unless we really see more downside in, in U.S. equities, I don't think we'll see much more action in gold. Uh, oil, uh, you'll be talking to my colleague, uh, Andy LeBeau. He can talk to you more about that. But uh, from what I'm seeing, a lot of the big research groups, uh, quasi-oil groups like OPE, uh, like uh, the IEA, EIA, they're all kind of ratcheting down their demand numbers going forward. Uh, and the feeling is that Iranian exports are not going to go to zero. They'll be they'll figure out a way to kind of keep that oil flowing. Um, so you know, fears of a supply crunch uh, are probably exaggerated. And of course, if they make some sort of a a, a deal, I, I shouldn't say a deal, but some sort of a narrative that. Uh, people could swallow with the Saudis without going uh, ballistic on them, uh, I think that'll, that'll keep the pressure on oil uh, even a bit more. Yeah, so. I look forward to speaking to Andy. I know he's been out of the country. Uh, right. while, while you've been out of the country doing work, he's been out of the country enjoying life. Right. He's, he's, he was in Italy, but he's back. And I think he's reading the EIA report as we speak. Right. <laughs> digging, digging through the numbers as he always yeah. does. But yeah, it's interesting. Oil, you know, we had a move. Oil still performing very well for the year. It's the, you know, the commodity sure. that's uh, really outperforming. Natural gas has, uh, as of late, been trading well. But, uh, you know, uh, it's, you know, we traded up to 77. Now we're trading down at 70. So we're about 10% off the high. Uh, you know, there's a lot of conflicting reports about how much uh, uh, supply is actually out there. Yes, exactly. And then as well, a lot of conflicting reports about what actually geopolitical, uh, um, you know, is priced into the market, what needs to be priced in, what's going on with Saudi Arabia right now is obviously right. forefront for everybody. Right. Michael, another interesting thing is what the global economy will do next year. If you look at PMIs, purchasing managers indices, they correlate very highly with commodity prices in general. If you plot all of them, you'll see most of them are heading south, yeah. except for the U.S. The U.S. is still <laughs> moving higher, a little bit of a, a, of a flattening recently, but it's sort of six are moving down and the U.S. is going up. Why we, is that? What do you think the cause well, of that is? Uh, uh, that's a good question. I mean, obviously, we have a lot of internal momentum here in the U.S. Uh, I think the corporate tax cuts really gave us a big boost this year, whereas they, they weren't really much of a factor elsewhere. Uh, trade possibly is more of an issue for some of these countries than it is for us, so the tariffs have hurt. But my general take is that the U.S. will start to slow as well, not now, but maybe by the second half of 2019. So we could see commodity markets kind of flat to a little bit higher depending on the commodity over the next 
three to six months. And then we're looking for, for a slight uh, uh, dip going into the second half. So oil, base metals, platinum, palladium, uh, I, I think will be a bit under pressure second half of next year. Yeah, well, that's, you know, what you point out there about the uh, PMIs heading down, um, it, it's interesting because you take a look and everybody seems to say, oh, the economy is doing so well, unemployment, you know, is ticking down, but global PMIs are not uh, looking pretty. And exactly so, right. Uh, exactly but right. It, the other interesting thing, though, if you take a look at the global equity markets, it's really an ugly year right now. Um, sure. Sure. You know, U.S. people, you know, a lot of our uh, subscribers are in the U.S. and a lot of people are taking a look at the U.S. markets. They kind of take a look at that. But I'm sorry, up here year to date, I mean, Chinese markets down between 20 and 30 percent. That's really right. bad. Hang Seng down 15 percent. Aspi right. down 12. Uh, then you go to Europe. The DAX is down 10, nine and a quarter percent. FTSE is down eight and a half percent. What are we doing here in the States? It's, up it's, four, everything's up. awesome. Everything's great. Yeah, but year to date, Nasdaq, year to date, Nasdaq's up ten, S and P's okay. up four and a half, Dow's up three and a half, uh, yeah. small cap Russell up two and a half. Yeah, um, and you know, given that's also coming off of last week's, which was one of the worst weeks in the market since February. Sure, sure. Um, Nikkei's flat on the year, um, but yeah, I mean, look, we still have a lot of time left in the year. Typically, uh, Q four is seen as um, uh, seasonality wise, it's typically pretty good for equities, but you know, we're off to an ugly start in October. Uh, we right. have the midterm elections coming up. We have some uncertainty coming out of China and uh, obviously a lot of uncertainty out of uh, Europe with uh, Brexit, with Italy. Sure. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of headwinds. And then on top of that, what you mentioned before, the PMIs uh, are not looking robust. Right, exactly. By the way, we are going to be publishing, to the extent that your readers are interested, and a base metals outlook for 2019. Uh, we'll, we'll send that to you when it's ready. It should be ready in about a month. And we kind of drill down uh, more granularly into copper, aluminum, zinc, and give you some numbers on where we think those are heading. Nice. Well, after you uh, post that, if we can uh, post it on our site, we will. And that would sure. be, uh, we'll have you back to uh, talk about that. That's uh, really interesting and, uh, you know, get into more. You know, everything's moving fast, so I'm sure there'll it be is. a big change in the markets uh, two weeks from now. We'll talk about gold at a certain level that probably won't be here and yes. uh, base metals as well. So Right, right. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Andy LeBeau, Commodity Research Group. I really appreciate the time. Uh, my pleasure, Michael, and we'll talk soon. All Definitely. the best to you. you Bye. Too.